so thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Gorlin. I'm a product manager for the Cisco Hyperflex uh, product platform. Um, we've got a lot to cover with you. We only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to use as much time as we can. But uh, please ask questions. Let's make it interactive. I first want to start at a high level with what's new. We're, you know, we, we just announced Hyperflex 3.0 just late last week. A lot of great excitement and a lot of great innovation there. So we'll start at that level, then we'll do a quick business update. Let's look at a year and review all the work we've done over the last 12 months, and there's quite a lot to talk about. We'll then dive specifically into the new Hyperflex platform that we have, along with some of the 3.0 innovations. We'll talk about some of those features in more technical depth. So somehow we'll get all that done in 30 minutes. So first of all, if we take a look at what Hyperflex and what we just announced, really Hyperflex is ready to take on any application in any cloud and at any scale. And specifically, if you look at the features that we've added in our 3.0 release to allow us to really hit these key elements, it starts with the application. We're extending our application support, not just from the VMware uh, ESX hypervisor that we always have, we're adding in Microsoft Hyper-V support. This will allow us to, to address uh, different applications, uh, giving customers choice which hypervisor they want, new application stacks. Um, so it's really great that we can take the greatness of the Hyperflex platform and bring it to Hyper-V. We're also adding in container support, so native support for, for persistent volumes inside of Docker containers. We're building a flex volume driver. I'll talk about what that means and why we decided to make that choice. And then in traditional Cisco fashion, uh, we've always had these Cisco validated designs, these reference white papers. Customers absolutely love them. And we're continuing to push on that front on the roadmap to add more and more support for enterprise applications. So today we already have support for, for, uh, for SAP, uh, SQL, Oracle, Oracle Rack, uh, the whole Microsoft suite as well. And we're continuing to push as customers are putting more and more of their workloads on Hyperflex. On the any cloud message, so we're bringing in some of the other assets that Cisco has in-house, um, where we can now tell a really great cloud story as well. So it starts with being able to monitor how the application is performing, and we can do that with App Dynamics. We can also do intelligent app, app placement, making sure our workload is balanced. We can use Cisco Workload Optimization Manager to help us fine-tune our environment. And then the cloud mobility and private cloud catalog come with our Cisco Cloud Center as well. And we'll talk about what all that means. But in, in an essence, you can take Hyperflex as your on-prem private cloud. And then with all of these other assets, you can really create a great multi-cloud story. And then with the any scale, we're pushing the scale limits. We're going all the way up to 64 nodes. Um, and we're doing so in a way that doesn't sacrifice Resiliency actually increases resiliency as we continue to scale. Uh, at the same time, as we're going and pushing into new mission crit critical workloads, we wanted to make sure that we could address stretch clustering. This is a, a big requirement for some of those uh, very high-end applications as well. And then as Jeff New had just described in the last session, we're changing the game in how we can do deployment at scale. So if you think 50, 100, 1,000 sites, how do you deploy hyperconverged into such a dense environment um, you know, that's so distributed in a sense that you have all these different sites. Well, with Intersight, we can now do it all centrally. That's really a game changer in the HCI space. So a lot of exciting things. We're going to dive deeper into each of these topics. But before we do, I want to talk about what we've accomplished in, in 2017. It's been an incredible year, if you've been following along with us. We've had so many major releases, it's hard to keep up. And, and everything on this top line we've, we've introduced in the last 12 months. So when we first came to market, we started with hybrid appliances. We saw very quickly customers wanted all flash. Right? But we haven't, we haven't stopped with the hybrid. We're still going to continue to offer both platforms. Customers need choice. There, there are use cases for both all flash and hybrid appliances, and we're pushing forward on both of those fronts. We brought in the 40 gig networking innovations that were in UCS, and we've seen a big performance increase, especially on the all flash systems with 40 gig. And that's a native part of Hyperflex, <coughs> bringing the network together with the compute and storage. We added support for self-encrypting drives. Customers wanted data at rest encryption, so that was something we absolutely had to do. We have it now on, on all platforms, M4, M5, hybrid, and all flash. We talked about enterprise workloads, so we're continuing to push out more and more CVDs and give our customers confidence that we can run these applications. And a lot of Cisco and Cisco there as well. So we have UC applications, we have a TRC, um, and we're trying to consume more of the Cisco portfolio <coughs> on top of hybrid. So you spoke before about enterprise workloads and the fact that you have um, validated designs. Have you been working with some, let's say, major vendors like Oracle or the database providers, for example, to validate certain use cases? Yeah, so we do have conversations. We, you know, Cisco works really well with a great partner system that we do have. A lot of times, sometimes the vendors want to work well with us and sometimes they don't. 
Uh, so it really depends on the application stack. But if you take a look at the CVDs, you'll see that we have some of the, some of the biggest names in there. And a lot of it is working with the technical marketing engineers at our, at our you know, partner company. About sharing some of them here for us to know? I don't have the specifics on which, which have uh, definitive partnerships, but we can certainly uh, talk to our technical marketing team and see, see which ones they are. Um, so um, we also introduce new tools that allow you to help size the environment properly, make sure that you get the right Hyperflex config, you're not overbuying or underbuying in the worst case. And then customers last year were telling us, look, we love Hyperflex, it works great in the data center, how do I get that same experience out at the edge? I want that same core file system, I want the same management, and so we introduced the edge offering that allowed us to push that same platform out to the remote office, branch office environments. We introduced Hyperflex Connect UI, a native HTML5 based management tool. And this coexists alongside with our vSphere Web Client plugin. On the replication side, we added an asynchronous replication done at the file system layer. So this allows you to replicate between Hyperflex clusters. And then, of course, we're solving that in 3.0. We're taking that a step further with synchronous replication with, uh, with stretch clusters. So, excuse me, you say you have uh, synchronous or uh, yeah, synchronous replication? For, uh, for the air cases. So we'll, yeah, we'll talk about, that's the new innovations. Okay. Um, we're, we're doing synchronous for stretch clustering. Um, so what, what we have today, prior to 3.0, we had asynchronous, okay. yeah. And then M5 Skylake, so uh, we were one of the first hyper-converged vendors continuing to innovate, staying up to date with the Intel roadmap, and we shipped this as, uh, almost as soon as the Intel Perly announcement happened. And what's more important there is we also made sure our customers weren't stuck with you know, if I have an M4 cluster, do I have to start all over again? We allow mixing of nodes, so you can bring in those new M5 nodes into an existing cluster and continue to scale out without having to start fresh. So as you can see, that's just a lot we covered in one year. That's a high level. Now, customers and partners are constantly telling us, you know, they, they put our stack up against other hyperconverged stacks, and they're seeing the performance of Hyperflex just outshine everybody else. And not just in terms of raw performance, but also in terms of consistency making sure that every VM gets the performance that it needs. And we've also had this independently validated by ESG. So check out the report. Really, Hyperflex claim to fame now has been how we do performance and consistency. The momentum has been tremendous. 2,000 customers is the last public figure we gave. It's significantly larger now. And uh, it's continuing to grow double digit uh, quarter over quarter. So very large growth in this area. So on your customers, last year at Cisco Live Europe 17, you announced that you had 1,000 customers. So these are 2,000 more customers, so you have 3,000 customers now, or is that an increase of 1,000 customers over the last 12 months? This is a total customer count, okay. correct? But uh, you know, as soon as we finish up our financial reporting, we'll update this number, and it's definitely significantly higher. And do you have, uh, among these customers, are, are those already existing Cisco customers, or do you have some net new customers which never uh, were uh, Cisco customers before that? It's actually a really great mix, and one of the great things about Hyperflex is it's a growth engine for Cisco. More than a third of those customers are brand new to UCS. They'd never bought a server from Cisco before. So we're definitely tapping into our existing install base. It's humongous, but we're also seeing a lot of up brand new customers as well. And then finally, we announced last year the acquisition of SpringPath. I, I came from SpringPath. We worked really well together as so two separate teams. That was last week, you announced that last week? The, the acquisition was last year. Okay, last year. Last year, yeah. yeah. So the companies are fully integrated now, and the fact that we're all under one umbrella means that uh, we can continue to innovate even faster. So I'm hoping when we're up here next year in 2018, we'll show this slide, you'll see even more of the fast-paced innovation that we have going on here. Okay, so let's talk about some of the key themes that Hyperflux has always been known for. We've always been adaptive, meaning we provide flexibility for the customer, and there's a lot of different areas that we're flexible. One is we allow you to reuse existing investment. If you have UCS compute-only nodes, you can bring those in. If you have existing architectures, you have fiber channel SAN, you've got network-based SAN, you can bring those in, right? We're not a rip and replace, we're really a solution that's designed to fit into an existing environment. And that's, our customers really are responding well to that message. Uh, the multi-cloud, as we talked about with the Cisco Cloud Center, we announced that last year, allows you to build out these blueprints that allow you to deploy on-prem and in multiple clouds using that, uh, that design. And then simplicity has always been a key message of Hyperflex, it's always been a key message of hyper-converged. But we're talking about end-to-end -end simplicity. So it's not just about how easy is it to install and upgrade. I'm talking about the entire life cycle, right? So how easy is it to size my environment? How easy is it to purchase, right? Do we do, you know, Cisco makes it easy with bundles to be able to purchase. To stand it up, we have uh, one of the best installers out there to make it very simple to stand up a new deployment. We make day two operations very simple as well with both the vSphere Web Client plugin and our HX Connect. 
And then when it comes to troubleshooting with TAC, we know TAC is the best in the industry. We have connected TAC, we have smart call home. You've seen some of the innovations in Intersight. We're trying to push the, the edge of what it means to provide that proactive customer support. So really, when you look at Hyperflex, it's a solution that's simple end to end. OK, so now we're taking it to the next level here. Any application, we talked about some of the CVDs that we have, Splunk and some others. We're continuing to push out, right? If there is a workload that's virtualized, it's a good candidate to run on Hyperflex. And the fact that we're bringing in Hyper-V support and container support is, means we can start um, using Hyperflex in more ways, more use cases and more applications. The Any Cloud, we keep talking about that this is a platform that allows you to have a private cloud um, as, as your starter and then use that as the on-ramp into various different public clouds with all the various tooling that we have. And then the Any Scale is all about you can start small with a Hyperflex, you know, start with a small cluster in a remote site, but you can use the same platform for your core data center, run your mission critical workloads all on the same platform. Right? So Hyperflex has a solution from you from the smallest to the largest scale. So if you look at the, uh, the platform, uh, this is what we had prior to 3.0. OK, so this is what's shipping right now. If you look at the bottom infrastructure layer, it's all built on our own custom log structured file system. We've talked about that again and again. We do wide striping, right? So we're, the way we're doing data placement, we're leveraging all of the nodes simultaneously. Um, and this gives us all of the performance and consistency that we're famous for. So all of these are, are foundational elements that make up our platform. We're on um, the VMware ESX hypervisor, the world's best hypervisor, most popular. Um, of course, we have great application support. And you can see we started in the robo VDI VSI space. That's very quickly overtaken now um, between databases, mission critical, even um, medical health records, you name it, the application stack. We're seeing customers put everything under the sun on top of Hyperflex. And we're really delighted to see customers uh, are really ramping up what they're using HX for. And then we have all the cloud uh, enablement at the top layer. Of course, this is surrounded by end-to-end -end security with the, all the Cisco assets. And then on the left-hand side, we have all of the new innovations with the Cisco Intersight platform. So this is where we are right now. And with 3.0, this is what our picture changes to. You can see how we're starting to fill in and provide more value and capabilities for our customers. So down at that platform layer, we're now expanding up to 64 node scale. And we're doing that with the availability zones that allow us to get more resiliency as we continue to scale. We're bringing in the stretch clustering, higher density. We have a new, um, new drives and new form factors, which we'll talk about, that allow this uh, higher density play. And then the flex volume driver is an, is an elemental piece that allows us to build for new uh, Kubernetes-based applications. So then when we move up the stack, we now have Hyper-V support. So customers now have a choice between VMware and Hyper-V. So, questions for anybody? Oh, yeah, any questions? Yeah, please feel free to interrupt anytime. So with the Hyper-V support, we'll bring in now customer choice. Um, with containers, of course, we'll have cloud native. Um, so you can see we're starting to build this out in a very nice way. And then at the top layer, App Dynamics and CWOM, again, is helping us with the story. And then all the way on the left, it's cut off on the screen here. You can see the HX Cloud deployment is a big game changer. We just, did, we just released that to GA a few weeks back. So getting back on the Hyper-V support and seeing that you have in the multi-cloud services, you have Azure, are you planning to, are you supporting some kind of Azure AD uh, on, on premises or something like that or not yet? So are you referring to like Azure Stack yeah. on-prem? So Cisco does have an Azure Stack solution. Yeah, it's, it's, it's orthogonal to HX. Yeah. It's sort of a, you know, you can choose depending on what the customer requirements are. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that, you know, UCS can solve multiple different customer challenges. OK, so let's dive deeper into each of these areas. I'm, I'm sure you're excited to get into the details on some of these new features, so let's do that. Um, I wanted to start out from just an architecture point of view. This is our pre-3.0 stack. If you can see, it was very custom built, purpose built. It works great on VMware. We have our core file system and data services layer. We speak to the VMware APIs and vCenter. Works very well. We're integrated with the vSphere web client, right? It was purpose built for, for that need. But what we need to do is we start moving into this multi-hypervisor world. We start moving into Hyper-V and containers. We need to disaggregate this. So we're moving to a layered approach, a more modular approach, where we took all of the greatness of those underlying layers, we've separated those, and now we can present new presentation layers. So in the example of Hyper-V, we now need to be able to speak SMB protocol. For, for containers, maybe we need to speak iSCSI, right? So this gives us a more modular approach. Also, as we start bringing in more management entities as well, 
we need to be able to start adding them in as customers start asking for more. And as you can see, this, this new architecture is modular. So as customers ask for more features, we'll be able to build onto the new framework. As we bring in new hardware innovations on the bottom, again, we want those hardware innovations to be leveraged by all layers in the stack. So this is what our Hyperflex 3.0 at a high level architecture looks like, giving us the ability to very rapidly innovate. Okay, so with Hyper-V specifically, again, it starts with that same core foundational element, the same file system that's tried and true, or 2,000 customers have been using it. No data locality, it's fully data distributed, so all of the benefits, performance benefits, are there. What we're doing is we're adding in a new scalable SMB3 file protocol support so we can speak inside of a Hyper-V world. We layer on top of this Windows Server 2016 data center core, and we're going to support this in both hybrid and all-flash models. As I said, we're, we're continuing with that theme here. And we're going to support all of the native Hyper-V features, so native failover clustering, the production checkpointing, all the things that you would come to expect with Hyper-V, HX is going to work seamlessly with it. And it's important when we talk to customers, we're not just selling an SMB you know, file system that's shared storage, we're selling them a solution, and the solution includes Hyperflex and the Windows feature set in Hyper-V 2016 to provide what the customer is ultimately looking for. And then at the management layer, we'll have support for SCVMM as the customer's license for System Center. If they prefer not to, they can still use Hyper-V Manager. That's perfectly okay. And we'll support the PowerShell commandlets that, uh, that Hyper-V has today. For the HX side, we'll use the REST-based API and our HX Connect UI to manage the Hyperflex functions. So let's look real quick at what the architecture is going to look like with Hyper-V. So if we start with a familiar three-node cluster here, uh, they'll have Windows Server 2016 installed on them. We'll have a very similar uh, user experience. We'll have an installer that will go through. It'll provision the controller VMs. It'll set up the network stack. It'll configure VLANs. It'll push the service profiles down. All the things that you've come to know with Hyperflex and UCS is the same in the Hyper-V world. <coughs> Those controller VMs will then come up together and they'll form a shared HX data store with a separate pool of capacity and a separate pool for cache. Okay? And then that HX data store, you can then create an SMB file share. So there'll be a, a mapping between those two. And that SMB file share is just like regular shared storage. All the servers have access to that share just as if it was running off of any filer. Of course, it's all about the VM. So you bring your application VMs in. They have your VHDX files. Those VHDX files live on that SMB file share. And then just like we do in the ESX world, we have this IOVisor module that reroutes the I.O. We do the same thing here. So um, as soon as we hit the IOVisor module, we have a hashing algorithm that makes sure that, that based on what type of I.O. we're doing, we're actually leveraging all the controller VMs simultaneously. So all the controller VMs are processing I.O. for all the VMs. We get very good level balance utilization and no hotspots in this, in this topology. So it works well. It's tried and true on the VMware uh, stack that we have. We wanted to replicate it in the Hyper-V world. So Hyper-V on HX is in EAP now with our customers, early access programs. So customers are playing with it, giving us some early feedback just tuning some of the documentation. So it's here, it's ready, and it's coming with 3.0. Any questions on the, the Hyper-V? Okay. So let's jump to the next uh, big anchor feature, which is our container support. So the problem IT is trying to solve is developers are going to the cloud, right? Developers need to have access to the native tooling for them to be able to do their work. And so what IT needs is a platform that allows them to go and develop on-prem, but give them the same tool set that they have in the cloud. So what we're doing is we're providing the support. Um, we built a flex volume driver, which basically means using a, a Kubernetes stack, um, an administrator, or, or a, rather a developer, can put in a pod request and ask for persistent storage. Right? So the whole problem we're trying to solve here is newer containers require stateful Right? They're stateful containers, they need storage. Wouldn't it be great if we could use the Hyperflex platform? It's very fast, it's resilient. How do we, how do we plumb that in inside of our containers? And so with the Flex Volume Driver, a developer can come in, he can make a pod request, and inside his pod request using our driver, he can do on-demand request, create, mount. All of that work is done automatically behind the scenes to give him a persistent volume for his containers. So we didn't think it was sufficient to just ensure that HX could be the plumbing to make sure that containers can have persistent storage. We wanted to take it to the, the entire length of the story to say, let's make sure that a developer can actually use this 
runtime, just like he would on AWS or GKE, right? They go in and they ask for storage. They don't care how it gets plumbed. The developer doesn't want to have to call his Hyperflex administrator and say, carve me out a LUN, what's my you know, IQN, none of that. The flex volume driver abstracts it all away and gives us support for persistent volumes inside of containers. <coughs> Any questions on that? Okay, so the next big anchor feature is uh, stretch clustering. So as we start moving into more mission critical applications, customers are asking for give me better resiliency, give me more uptime. How do we do that? Well, we simply take a cluster and we distribute it across two sites. Um, this is still one logical storage cluster. And we're doing synchronous replication across the two, so we're mirroring all of our writes across both sites. This ensures that we can tolerate all different types of failure scenarios. So we can lose an entire site, we can lose local disks, local nodes, we can have a network partition. No matter what you throw at a stretch cluster, it's designed so that you can uh, quickly resume your operations on, on the surviving nodes, surviving site. Uh, just a quick question regarding this. What kind of latency do you support between the two sites? Yeah, good question. So uh, for right now, um, with 3.0, um, we're requiring a 10 gig link between the two sites and a maximum of five millisecond RTT uh, between the two sites. Because as, you know, as latency goes up, <coughs> performance exponentially decreases. Sure. So those are the numbers we're starting with. Uh, they're not necessarily ingrained in stone. We'll just have to see what the performance looks like beyond that. So this is a zero RPO solution because it is synchronous. Every write is committed on both sides before it's acknowledged back to the application. And it's, a, it's almost a near zero RTO because we're using native VMware HA features to restart the VMs if, if we have a site outage. So you don't have to have a run book. You don't have to go use SRM. That's the whole beauty of this HA solution. And we've also optimized it such that the read path is local. So we have multiple copies on both sides. All of the IO reads can happen locally. And then only the writes have to be replicated across both sites. So this is also an EAP. Customers are testing it now a lot. We have a couple partners in Europe that are, that are running this and they're giving us some, some feedback as well. And this will be shipping in 3.0 time as well. So do you have any specific requirements for um, having a zero RPO on, uh, on that solution, on the stretch cluster, like latency or something like that? Yeah, so similar to his question, there will be network requirements between these two sites. That's the biggest hurdle really when it comes to a stretch cluster. And then we'll also have a witness appliance, right, okay. as a third party arbitrator. Um, most architectures use a witness, and so there'll be a latency requirement between the two sites and between the witness, mm -hmm. and we'll have all of those documented as well. Okay, the witness is a virtual appliance? It'll be a virtual appliance, yep. Mm -hmm. So you can put it on anything that could just run a VM. It could be in the cloud, it could be in a closet, you know, it could be on your laptop, it just needs to be run. Uh, got a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. Do the cluster nodes have to be on the same subnet, on the same layer two network, or is it just pure IP routing? So today we're asking for stretched layer two. Uh, there are various technologies we can use to stretch layer two. Um, but, uh, don't go there. <laughs> but there, you know, there's no hard requirement on the file <coughs> system or the way we built it for layer two. It's more about what can we get tested in real time frames. Mm -hmm. So I think what's going to end up happening is we'll start with layer two, and then um, in a follow-on release we'll qualify layer three topology because there's no inherent limitation that we have to go with layer two. It's just so you're not using time. multicast or something like that? No, 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 absolutely not. Uh, so it's all IP unicast? Yes. And do you have any um, requirements regarding to MTU or packet size? So we, we do use jumbo frames um, within our clusters for traditional hyperflex. We're using 9216 jumbo. Uh, we would want jumbo frames to be enabled to cross this link as well. Otherwise, you'll be artificially you know, sort of hampering your cluster. So it, we're not going to require it. If, if you can't do jumbo frames across that link, you can still deploy a hyperflex cluster, but you're not getting the most bang for your buck because you'll have the additional packet overhead. Yeah, pff, jumbo frames is in most cases only over dark fiber available, yeah. So, so that's why we'll at least give you the choice. You know, if, you can, if you can get it, that's great opportunistically. If you can't, we'll still be able to support you. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're very excited about the stretch cluster. That's going to unlock a lot of use cases for us, and customers really, really want that feature. <clears throat> the last major anchor area for Hyperflex 3.0 is how are we scaling the platform? And we're scaling in three vectors. The first is we want to continue to offer a cost-effective way to scale, meaning we want to lower the dollar per gigabyte. We want to be able to get denser in our platforms. So there's two ways we're doing this. The first is we've qualified, and this is currently shipping, a new 1.8 terabyte 10K SAS drive for the hybrid platforms. 
So this allows you to get 50% more storage over the 1.2s that we were using. Uh, so that's a, a very nice option. We're seeing customers adopt that very quickly. And then the other area is we're bringing in a new chassis. We're bringing in a, a, C, a, a HX240 large form factor. So we're bringing those three and a half inch large form factor drives, six and eight terabyte initially will be what will be qualified. This will allow us to go very dense in terms of storage. So at the end, when all is said and done, Hyperflex will have multiple tiers that we can choose from. On the high end, we'll have all flash with either Optane optimized or NVMe caching. We'll have all flash with regular SAS based <coughs> caching. We'll have small form factor for performance but cost sensitive customers. And then we'll have large form factor for those that really need the deep storage and really capacity optimized. So you'll be able to use Hyperflex in whatever use case you need and all those different flavors. The second area we're scaling is the node count itself. So uh, we're going all the way up to 64 node clusters. This is the vSphere cluster limit. So hopefully that'll put to bed any, you know, any competitive, you know, how far can we scale, excuse me, how far can we scale? This will be supported across hybrid and all flash, M4, M5, and mixed clusters. So any existing customers out there can continue to seamlessly expand all the way up to the 64 node cluster size. Well, a key element is we wanted to make sure we would scale in a way that would give us more resiliency. Right? We don't want to just scale um, yeah, and in increase our failure domain. We want to decrease our failure domain as we're scaling, and that's with a feature called LEZ. So on the 64 node cluster size specifically, it's going to be 32 hyperconverged nodes, HX nodes, and up to 32 compute nodes. These compute nodes can be uh, pretty much any C series or B series server managed under UCS manager today. So we started with you know just a specific set of PIDs. Now, as, as long as it's a UCS server, M3, M4, M5 <coughs> generation, most of those are now supported. And customers can reuse them, and there's no licensing fee to do so either. So very compelling being able to use those compute nodes. So can you elaborate a bit on the availability zones? Is that something that you can customize completely, or is that yeah. based on a, on a rack or something like that? Yeah, good question. So the automated availability zones is going to basically take our cluster and logically segregate it. There's no management overhead for this feature, so it's all automated. The administrator just turns it on. He can optionally specify zones, but, but we prefer to leave it automatic mode. You turn it on, and what it'll do is it'll segregate you into groups, and the data placement policy will change to say, I'm only going to put one copy of data in each zone. And by doing this, it allows us to decrease our failure domain. And so now we can tolerate more disk failures, more node failures. We can throw a lot more at it, especially in the larger cluster sizes. So in the case of um, a cluster where you have several blades on a B-series, is it able to kind of to query the chassis information to create different, different, different zones? For example, how do you, uh, let's imagine the unlikely event where you're losing a blade, uh, not a blade, but an entire chassis for whatever reason. Is there a way to make sure that the workloads are, let's say, split, or not the workload, but the way the data is replicated across the, across the blade, not across the blades, across the, um, the enclosures, the chassis, you know, to make sure that you still have this kind of fellow domain somehow segregated? Yeah, it's a good question. So for Hyperflex specifically, um, the nodes that would become a part of the availability group are the uh, hyperconverged nodes, so they'll be rack mount. But mm -hmm. your question about location awareness is an important one. Mm -hmm. So this is all a logical construct. There's no physical input of what the rack awareness is. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine this is a foundation where in a future release, all we have to do is add the administrator controls to say, well, instead of automating this, yeah. let the administrator figure it out. Or maybe through intelligent APIs, we can query mm -hmm. what the stack looks like. So that'll be an evolution of this feature, but we wanted to give the administrator the ability to flip a switch and instantly get better resiliency without having to worry about the placement policy. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, the last major anchor feature. I just wanted to, again, hit on the multi-platform uh, aspect. It's all about the application at the center. That's what we want to care and feed. At the top layer, we want to make sure we get visibility into the performance of that application. We can use App Dynamics for that. We also want to make sure the infrastructure that supports that application has the resources that it needs. Maybe it's undersized, or maybe worse, maybe it's oversized and we can reclaim it or rebalance it in a certain way. So Cisco Workload Optimization Manager gives us the tools to make those right decisions. The Cisco Cloud Center gives us both the ability to blueprint our applications for deployment in multiple <coughs> areas, along with the private cloud self-service catalog and, and IaaS capabilities that come native to it. And then it's all about Hyperflex, where Hyperflex hopefully will be your on-prem instantiation of a private cloud. And Hyperflex is designed to work seamlessly within this ecosystem. And then just, just to, to hit on this one more time, where, where Jeff knew in the previous session was talking about Intersight, uh, I wanted to make sure it was really clear on how this is uh, you know, affecting Hyperflex. 
So Hyperflex is a first class entity inside of Intersight. We have some really great use cases for monitoring and management, but the cloud deployment piece is the real game changer. And there's no one else in the hyperconverged space that's even close to being able to provide this level of uh, functionality to customers. So think about the example where I have a thousand remote sites and I need to deploy hyperconverge across a thousand sites. How am I gonna do it? Well, without Intersight, you've got a huge logistical problem. Typically, you know, uh, customers will leverage a staging site, maybe they'll leverage a partner to do this, right? They'll take the gear out, they'll check everything, maybe they'll configure it partially, box it up again, ship it to the end site, the administration team, you know, an IT guy will fly out, they'll stand it up, rinse and repeat. This staging process is very complex, it's time consuming, it costs money, flying people out is really inefficient. So how do we do this in a better way? We want to do it like a Meraki style, right? I want to just be able to have my access point and be able to configure it all remotely. So with Intersight, what, what, what you can do is now you can ship your Hyperflex servers directly to the end site. All you have to do is rack it, connect power, and connect the network. Network will pull a DHCP address. It'll automatically phone home to the Intersight cloud. You can then claim it securely using our two-factor authentication mechanism. The servers are now available in Intersight, and the administrator from anywhere, probably the remote office, can kick off a deployment. And so we've added tools inside of Intersight. We have an HX cluster profile that allows you to create all of the configuration in advance. You can clone those profiles. You can use policies as well to make sure that it's consistent, right? Maybe I want to make sure I'm using the same DNS and NTP server on all my sites. We can easily do that in Intersight. And then deploy them all in parallel. So you can deploy five, 10, 100 sites in parallel, uh, you know, all from a remote cloud. So it's very compelling what we can do to change this operational model really give our customers the power to deploy Hyperflex at scale as well. Um, just a quick question on the, how uh, the single, let's say, single touch deployment is working. When the server arrives, do you have somehow pre-configured that server that it is uh, reporting to the right tenant and to the right customer, or how is this working? Yeah, so everything comes preloaded from the factory. The, the BMC versions and the firmware is already at the version that works with Intersight. All you have to do is make sure that you have outbound connectivity. Um, so outbound 443 to our, our service URL. Uh, you can also use a proxy server optionally as well. If you don't have the direct access, you can go through a proxy. And then from there, it's sitting in an unclaimed state. And you as the administrator can come in and claim it. And in order to claim it, you have to have the device serial number. And you have to have the rolling claim code. So every, every couple of minutes, there's this code that changes in the IMC, and you can get that all remotely. So as soon as the system comes online, through in-band management, you can go pull that information and then securely claim it in Intersight. Ah, OK. So you are doing it across the serial number. You need to have this information so that it is reporting to your Intersight tenant. Yeah. Okay. That's how it's working today, which is still, uh, still much better than where we were. Um, but ultimately, we're going to get better where maybe when you order, you can actually have your server pre-claimed. So when it shows up, you don't have to claim it at all. Those are the optimizations we're using. Do you still print the serial numbers on the box outside? Yeah. Hmm. So we're trying to find a way to do it in a secure method. That's the reason we haven't done it yet. And there's some ideas that we're, we're talking about within the engineering team. Certificates or something like that. Yeah, so there's like in the Meraki world, Meraki does this. They have a way to know if the server is still fresh from factory to make sure nobody, you know. Tampered. Someone tampers with it and handling. So there are all these different methods we're looking at. So I just wanted to wrap up real quick. As you can see, Hyperflex 3.0, we've got a lot of content here. We're innovating faster than we ever have. We can now do any application on any cloud and at any scale. So thank you all. If uh, you know, We'd love for you to attend some of our breakout sessions. We have UCS and HX sessions here. We also have the World of Solutions come by. You can see some of the demos. We have videos and TMEs that can talk with you. And if you want some one-on-one -on -one time, feel free. I'll be around, and some of my colleagues as well, and we can dive deeper into any of these topics. <coughs> okay, any questions? All right, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you.